public service by your local cable television operator. Next, biography on Book TV with Mary Dearborn discussing this work, Mailer, a biography. The book chronicles the life of author Norman Mailer. It reviews his professional career, such as winning the Pulitzer Prize twice, to his colorful personal history. Her remarks took place recently at a Barnes & Noble booksellers in New York City. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'd like to welcome you all to Barnes & Noble. Uh, it's a real pleasure for us tonight to welcome Mary Dearborn. She joins us to, dis to discuss her new book, Mailer, a biography. Uh, Mailer is the first full account of the legendary writer. With unprecedented access to Mailer's friends, relations, and antagonists, and making extensive use of photographs and correspondence never before published, uh, Mary's biography fills in the familiar outlines of Mailer's personal life from his brilliant successes uh, as well as his notorious failures. Uh, Mary holds a doctorate in English and comparative literature from Columbia. She is also the author of the highly acclaimed books The Happiest Man Alive, a biography of Henry Miller, and Queen of Bohemia, The Life of Louise Bryant. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mary Dearborn. Hi, and th thanks for coming, and especially thanks for coming out on a night like this. Um, I actually didn't want to call the book Mailer. I wanted to call it Cock of the Walk, and not just because it was for the double entendre, but because Norman often reminds me of a, a bantam cock in a barnyard. Um, <laughs> He, um, what made me think of it first was that he spends his summers and actually all of his time now in Provincetown on the tip of Cape Cod. And um, uh, it's a small community. He doesn't choose to go to the Hamptons, he goes to Provincetown, and it's mostly gay. And uh, it's a house mostly of clabbered, um, I mean, a neighborhood of clabbered houses with um, stairs going up the sides and sort of down at heels but really nice and norm but norman norman has a brick mansion in the west end of town and it always struck me that he wanted to be in provincetown because it could be a big fish in a little pond something be a cock of the walk um anyway i i think the onus is on me to tell you why i wanted to write about norman mailer um <clears throat> i could tell you notorious stories till the cows come home but i thought i'd do this by just reading a few bits um this is about a project that Norman um, put on in the mid-60s, which is when he was doing really his best writing. He was just getting involved with the Vietnam movement. He'd done all the wonderful path-breaking journalism on Kennedy and the New Frontier. And um, he was very busy. But in the background, literally, at his Brooklyn brownstone, and also keep in mind how small brownstone living rooms are. They aren't really that big. Me uh, in the background was a project Mailer began in the fall of 1965, ongoing for the rest of the year, and still in residence in the living room of his Brooklyn Heights brownstone, a model for an imaginary city made entirely out of Lego blocks. In many ways, this was a typically Mailerian project. He announced it in advance in the pages of the New York Times Magazine. The pro city he, he outlined, he said, would change the face not only of public architecture, but of society itself. He had long blamed architecture for many of the woes of contemporary society, and now he applied himself to setting forth his plans and pronouncements, and beginning in the fall of 65, the creation of an actual model, um, actual model city, immense in scale and meticulously planned. Uh, the building of an elaborate model of, made out of children's box may seem frivolous, but Mailer was very earnest about addressing social ills through architecture. In reviewing Lyndon Johnson's campaign book, my hope for America. He was struck by Johnson's claim that in 50 years there would be 400 million Americans, four-fifths of them in urban areas, and that it was necessary to rebuild the entire urban United States. In response to this, Mailer decried blandly institu institutional modern architecture, especially flat top si si skyscrapers without ornaments on them. He thought that to spare the countryside, maintain small towns, and keep the old urban neighborhoods, especially those with character, cities must be built upward. Um, 
There's a picture in my book of the scale of this Lego city, and you can see it's taller than he is. And if you look at it close up, it's really quite neat. Um, he wrote in architectural form, we must be able to live in houses 100 stories tall, 200 stories high, far above the height of buildings as we know them. New cities with great towers must r rise on the plain, cities higher than mountains, cities with room for 400 million to live. His new obsession wasn't really so odd. Norman had trained at Harvard as an engineer. Um, a lot of, when I was doing the research for this book, a lot of, I talked to a lot of Norman's Harvard classmates, and most of them didn't, said he could not possibly have majored in engineering. There was no engineering major. But he did, in fact. It was really to please his parents. He'd been good as a child at building model airplanes. They thought maybe he had a talent in that direction. Uh, but anyway, he majored as an engineer, and he loved building, enjoyed making things, and was reasonably good at it, always inventive. He decided to build a model of a city that could be populated by four million people and to build it in his own living room. He conceived it as a monument to his sweeping utopian vision. Uh, at the quotidian level, Norman acted as the brains behind the project, soon discovering that he didn't like the sound of the plastic Lego pieces snapping together. It struck him, he said, as vaguely obscene. He delegated the task to his wife's stepbrother and to a uh, Provincetown handyman. And the two men drove Norman's 1961 blue convertible Falcon out to the Lego plant in New Jersey. He can't just go to Toys R Us. He goes to the Lego plant and returned with cases of the co colored blocks. Then Norman them, directed them to build, instructing them to create hanging bridges, buildings with trap doors, and four-foot-high towers, all constructed on a um, piece of plywood. Picture this in a brownstone living room, four by eight on five feet legs, five feet tall legs. Constru construction proceeded apace, and Norman re never really did call a halt to it. But someone from the Museum of Modern Art came out to Brooklyn to take photographs of the model, hoping to display it at the, at the museum. At that point, Mailer and his helpers found that the city could not be taken out of the apartment. They consulted movers with cranes and took measurements of, glass, of the glass in the front windows, but they soon saw it couldn't be removed without being disassembled first. Here, Norman drew the line. He told the handyman to build a fence around it and leave it where it was. And there it still sits, occupying a third of the living room's floor space. Um, wife number four, Beverly, who contributed a scale model of the United Nations, about that big, to indicate the overall scale of city, professes that she loved it but concedes, quote unquote, it was a bitch to dust. Um, I think there's a, a number of features of building the Lego city that really strike me as very typically Norman Mailer. First of all, it's something that um, many of us might visualize, but few of us would do. Um, it's, it's, Mailer puts ideas into reality. That's one of his specialties. The idea of delegating work to his lackeys is very Mailerian. He conceives an, of an idea, and he tells his buddies, you carry it out. Um, going to the top to the Lego plant rather than the local toy store, that's very Norman. Um, and the idea of a sort of game quality, especially a boy's game, is very typical of him. He brought this sort of childish glee to some of these projects. Um, there's a story that I told that didn't get it, that I've heard that didn't get its way into the book about Norman reading about um, a guy, in, some criminal, or bringing $25,000 to somebody in a briefcase. And one of his, a couple of his flunkies were there with him when he, when he read this. And he wondered, how many bills would you have to have and in what denomination? And you or I might wonder this in passing, especially if we're very imaginative and curious, we might think, how many? But what Mailer did, and he had his flunkies did, was sit down with a bunch of paper and glue, and glue paper together, make the thickness of bills, and then figure out mathematically what denomination this would be. And this would, and to his satisfaction, found how do you fit $25,000 in a briefcase. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, if you were going to use it in a novel, it's one thing. But this and the Lego, um, the Lego, uh, uh, model were not, they didn't hurt anyone, they were, um, um, they were just typical of his energy and imagination, and the idea of actually putting something into being, actually doing something. I found this, when, one of the things that I admire Norman most for is his, um, is his um, race for mayor in um, New York City in 1969, and some of you probably remember that. Um, it was a, 
it was a distinctive campaign. He took it really seriously. The, the central platform was um, uh, that New York should secede from the Union and become the 51st state. And uh, that fiscally, this wasn't really very sound. Though he worked it out exactly in his position papers. He was in deadly earnest. But some of the, the visions that he had were really, were really um, prescient. And a lot of the ideas that he had in the mayoral campaign that were part of his platform have actually been floated with you know, some seriousness. And he wanted to close Manhattan to cars. I mean, that's something that's been floated for a long time. Some of them were pretty fanciful, but they weren't likely to hurt anyone, really. He wanted to build um, Vegas East at Coney Island. Not bad. Um, he wanted to hold a yearly Grand Prix in Central Park. Well, that might hurt somebody, but, uh, but you know, if it's, you know. Um, on the other hand, he wanted to have, here, a Central City Farmer's Market with ethnic foods for sale. That's pretty good, 1969, it happened. Um, he wanted every neighborhood to have a zoo. And one of the central platforms was neighborhood control, um, which was really uh, forward-looking. He wanted people in a certain neighborhood to decide how often they wanted their garbage to be picked up, who their garbage men should be, all from garbage on up and on down to every issue, issue should be up to the neighborhoods. Uh, I don't know how this would be implemented, but he, he had a vision. Um, he wanted to return national baseball teams to Brooklyn and Manhattan. Um, and he wanted, one of my favorites, he was, he wanted to grow ivy on housing projects. My first reaction is, what does he think this is, a Harvard Yard? But if you think about it, they really, they actually would look, the big brick ones that he really hated, they'd, they'd look really good. I know it's bad for buildings. Um, one of the ticket's most controversial things was um, something called Sweet Sunday, which is the day one, one day a week Sunday when every all electricity would be turned off, there'd be no traffic in or out of the city, and as he said, on the first hot day, the population would curse him, demand he be imp impeached. He was, this is typical of his political thinking um, throughout what I consider his most active years, which were the 50s and 60s. He demanded of politicians that they show imagination. He didn't want there to be politics as usual. Um, he was a big, this is why I think he was so responsive to Kennedy. He wrote maybe the um, most important essay about Kennedy, one that he modestly claimed um, got Kennedy elected, called Superman Comes to the Supermarket, about, um, about, among other things, the Democratic primary. But he was constantly writing letters to the president, open letters to the president, he called them, to both Kennedy and LBJ. And some of these were wackier than others. He wanted, for instance, Kennedy, he said he wanted him to form an adventurer's corps that would be alongside the Peace Corps. And the adventurers, the people who volunteered for this corps, would um, fight alligators in the Everglades, and they'd ski the snowfields of the West. Um, one that he floated all the time was that every um, everybody, even street hoodlums, needed to act, needed some way to express themselves. And his favorite idea for this was to have jousting in Central Park. Um, he he brought this up several times, but um, I think it's I think it just shows a certain energy. He saw that there was a lot of potential there in juvenile delinquents, I guess, and a lot of energy, and he wanted to tap it somehow. Now, the, the, I did find one campaign button that said, I'd sleep better if Norman Mailer was mayor, and I really kind of disagree. I wouldn't, but um, partly for things like that. But um, he, he did think that um, he wanted to put ideas into action. He, didn't, he wasn't content with, with just floating ideas. And this came out most clearly in his um, recognition of, of JFK. He, um, he immediately saw that there was a new politics of celebrity going on. He'd a few years, uh, well, not really, at the same time he was discovering celebrity himself in writing advertisements for myself, which is one big rant about Norman Mailer and how great he is and how he got that way. And it's, uh, he discovered, really, that what he needed to become was a celebrity. And I think this is really, um, well, Kennedy aside for a minute, I think this is unique. I think this is one of the many things that makes Norman unique in American letters, is he set out to be a celebrity, for good or for ill. The only one who really precedes him in this is Hemingway, I think. And I, I think Hemingway is the most important figure of the first half of the century and of the last century, Norman of the second. There's a sort of, um, 
I read one review of my book that seemed to be of a, of a, by a young person in a like a uh, alternative newspaper who said, "Wow, you know, man, um, <laughs> this guy's really a writer." Um, he said, "If I want to a cocktail party, do I want to sit next to David Foster Wallace? No, I want to sit next to Mailer." And it's got a point. And I think you don't see writers who are engaged in the same way. Sometimes it's not their fault. I'm not sure how you'd set out to be. Norman Mailer or be a, a clone of Norman Na Norman Mailer now, um, it's very hard to do. If you think of, when I was thinking about this, I thought of another novel to, novelist to whom Mailer could fairly be compared, Don DeLillo. Now, I don't know what Don DeLillo looks like. I mean, that might be my fault, but he's not out there in the sense that, that Mailer's been out there for all these years. Anyway, he, he saw um, in Kennedy a real, some real energy, something really happening, and he saw that the country needed um, somebody like Kennedy, that there is a uh, need for heroes. Um, and he wanted, to, he saw himself as playing a role in this administration somehow. At first he thought himself, he saw himself as an advisor, and then as he realized that he was becoming a bit um, ridiculous, he thought himself as a sort of court jester, that maybe there would be a place for him as that. So I I'm, I'm just want to read two paragraph, paragraphs about him meeting Kennedy. He met Kennedy in Hyannis um, just before the election. And they had this strange conversation. Norman prepared for it in a really strange way. Anyway, on the way out, Kennedy, at Norman's urging, guessed what kind of car Norman drove. And he guessed wrong, picking a Volkswagen. <laughs> Norman corrected him. No, it's a Triumph TR3. He had a Triumph TR3. He used to take the family up to Provincetown in the summer. He had two girls and two standard poodles in a sports car. And, and I've confirmed this with one of the wives, and I don't know how he did it. Anyway, he, he said it's a Triumph TR3, and th at this point, Norman supposed, quote, I had him twice. But he blew it, he thought, when Kennedy asked him to come back the next day and bring a guest. Norman chose to take his second wife, Adele, which he later came to believe was a mistake. Kennedy would know Norman was trying to impress his life, his wife, whereas, this is what he wrote later, if I brought Arthur Schlesinger or somebody of that ilk, he would have known he was dealing with somebody formidable. It's difficult to see how impressing the president was more important than showing the simple good manners of inviting his wife, but Norman had invested this meeting with considerable meaning. For this second meeting, Norman and Adele speeded down the Cape, Norman late and angry because Adele couldn't provide him with a clean shirt. The Kennedys met them with their usual charm. Jackie admired Adele's sweater, and Jack gave her a tour of the house, showing her Jackie's paintings and asking about her own artwork. Er, uh, Adele was an artist. And somebody had obviously briefed them about the mailers, for in his private meeting with Kennedy, Norman was most impressed that a Kennedy named not his bestseller, The Naked and the Dead, but instead the novel he'd most recently published, The Deer Park, which to Norman's mind, The Deer Park, its subject, um, very briefly, is sex, politics, and Hollywood. And um, it, Norman thought, and Kennedy choosing this um, over the Naked and the Dead as the book he said he'd read, confirmed that to Norman that he was some kind of existential hero, as he called Kennedy in, in the piece, Superman Comes to the Supermarket. And only such a hero would appreciate his existential mo n novel about sex and time. I think that, you know, in confronting Ken uh, Kennedy in this way and kind of making a jerk of himself. Again, he's showing something that's very typically mailer, which is he wants to, um, um, first he wants the writer to have a role in the new politics. He always believed, his, his ideal was of, um, the writer who was somehow engaged in politics, engaged in what was going on, never outside of it. Um, and he th saw the writer's role as shaking things up, questioning authority, and confronting the status quo. And sometimes, you know, like when he meets Kennedy, he's like, he's a little off. And the Kennedys, he never really did succeed in winning a place in the Kennedy administration. Um, Jackie once told him that she admired his way of doing journalism, of putting himself in the piece, and wondered if he could ever do history that way. And this was a little note she sent to them, you know, very polite after meeting him. And he wrote back and said, yes, in fact, he'd always wanted to um, write a biography of the Marquis de Sade and see if he could do some strange justice to the man. You know, see, he thought 18th century French, Jackie liked both these things. She might 
dig the idea, but he totally misread it. And when he came, he was hired by Esquire to write an article about Jackie, and she wouldn't speak to him. And he later uh, um, later had a big quarrel with Norman Podhoritz because Podhoritz had Jackie to a dinner party and didn't have Norman. Um, anyway, I thought you might want to hear a little bit about why these these are reasons why I did pick him, and aside from the all the negative aspects of um, Mailer. I originally, um, I did write a biography of Henry Miller, and Henry Miller um, was, a, of course, one of our, supposedly one of our um, most notorious male chauvinists. And I found in writing this bo the book that that really wasn't the case. It was much more complicated than that. And Mailer came up when I was working on that book because um, not only is Mailer also a writer from Brooklyn, um, he's a, uh, you know, he, he has sexual content in his work. In many ways, the lifting of the ban on the tropics uh, in the early 60s made a lot of Norman's work possible. So they sort of had a relationship because Norman published a book of um, a collection of Henry Miller's writings, and it's one of, he with interspersed with his own commentary, and it's one of the best pieces of criticism on Henry Miller that I that I saw in all of my writing of the, uh, his biography, um, he identified with, with Miller. It didn't go the opposite way. <laughs> um, Miller just didn't know what to make of Miller. He was like in his 80s when he met him, and he's like, who's this New Yorker? <coughs> um, so Miller was looming on my horizon, and Miller makes so much sort of background noise that you can't ignore him. And I began to think about a trilogy that would include Miller and Mailer and later Ernest Hemingway. And um, the, the common thread should be obvious, though. I really want to stress that these aren't feminist screeds. I consider myself a feminist. These are um, attempts to understand how these most macho of men have um, shaped ideology about sex and gender in our culture, have um, depicted women and sex roles and, and asked how these might be changed. And I think of them more as um, um, experimenters. Um, this is a little misleading with Mailer because he's a great conservative about sex. He doesn't believe in condoms, even in the age of AIDS. Specifically, he thinks that um, sex should be dangerous. Um, he's very against masturbation. Really, sex is only to procreate. Um, this from the guy that we think of as our, as our most macho man. He said that women's real purpose was to, only purpose in life was to go out and find the best male she could and have children and further the species. Um, now that sounds like it's, but it, um, it's pretty cut and dried sexist, but it's really not. He's much more complicated than that. Um, anyway, so I do project a book about Hemingway in the future. I'm hoping to take a break because of I can't take all that testosterone. Um, between Miller and Mailer, I wrote a biography of Louise Bryant called Queen of Bohemia. And Louise Bryant was um, John Reed's companion and a journalist who you might know from the movie Reds, um, where she was played by Diane Keaton. That was a really nice break between Miller and Mailer. Um, anyway, then I thought that if you put up with me reading one more thing, I think his finest hour was really in 1967 and 1968 when um, he joined in the march on the Pentagon against the war and later wrote um, The Armies of the Night about this. He was, um, he didn't know what his role was in, um, in uh, uh, the Vietnam protest because he was a middle-aged man by that time and he was in a three-piece suit and he in fact wore a three-piece suit the whole time at the Pentagon. He was arrested, went to jail. and he, the whole time he had his three-piece suit. Did he have a place? What was his place? Was it appropriate? Did he could he make a difference? And his um, Norman Mailer would never be a typical leftist. You, you might know he calls himself a left conservative, but he's completely incapable of what's required for leftist politics, which is submitting yourself to a collective. You know, I mean, Norman just can't get that. He's got to be the star. But Armies of the Night, he really saw he saw that about himself, and he saw that it was a limitation about himself. But he thought that there were still were things he could do, and um, I think it's I think it was a great success on his part. So I think his personal triumph then, and the triumph of the book, 
is that as a middle-aged man who wears a suit and has an established literary career at stake, he has nonetheless found a way to be engagé, to be part of the prote protest in a meaningful way. He was in the protest with um, Robert Lowell, the poet, and they had quite a competition going. You mail her any writer in the room, he has to have a competition going. But especially Lowell had come up to him and said, you know, Norman, sometimes I think you're the best journalist in America. And, and Norman came back and said, you know, Cal, sometimes I think I'm the best writer in America. So they had a little thing going. And, and Lowell l later wrote a poem about the protest. Um, for Norman's arrest did mean something, it did count, and he was right to ask whether the book he wrote could be compared to the 800 lines of poetry Robert Lowell had to show from the same event. For the book had a profound effect. The second half provided an anatomy of the new left and the mechanics of mounting and mobilization. Young leftists found it an astute analysis and were impressed by the passion Mailer brought to the work. Across the political spectrum, readers who watched the student, student movement with varying degrees of approval or censure were made to understand that what was going on in the streets and on college campuses and in the capital itself was a real phenomenon that had to be taken extremely seriously. The country's future, no less, was at stake. By inserting himself in the narrative and making himself so fundamentally likable with all his foibles, Mailer created a character who is believable and trustworthy. He demanded to be heard, but in the most beguiling way possible. If what he had to say was unpalatable to many, he reminded his readers of his fundamental love of and concern for his country and asked that everyone come together in this dark hour when, quote, ignorant armies clash by night. Um, anyway, I thought I'd stop there and take questions, if you have questions. Um, you're good to be out here at all. Yeah. Yeah, I heard something very strange once. Somebody was claiming that uh, uh, American Dream was based in fact, and he did murder a wife, but it sounded too far out to be credible. But uh, and, I'll, and besides that, I was wondering if uh, you looked into the years when he was anxious to climb into the ring and uh, fight people. <laughs> well, that's pretty much his whole life. He's, but it's true, an American Dream is about a man who murders his wife and gets away with it. And Mailer stabbed his second wife in 1960, and he nearly killed her. It was at a really drunk and horrible party at his house, and he was really driven around the bend by heavy drinking, heavy marijuana use, paranoid thinking. He's a little bit prone to paranoid, to paranoia. Um, sometimes this is this energy is funneled into his best work but sometimes he gets a little paranoid he was real paranoid then he had an open letter to castro sitting on his um desk and uh he he called this he announced this party to announce that he was running for mayor and he wanted um he said he wanted his his uh community there who he took to be the disenfranchised people who <laughs> who didn't vote. And so he asked all these people off the street. At the same time, he asked George Flint and his friend to make sure the power structure came. So there were all these big, well, he, got, he, he hit George Flint that night because the power structure didn't exactly turn out. But anyway, at the end of this really long and really drunken um, evening, he stabbed his wife. And it nearly penetrated her cardiac sac. And basically, he got, he got away with it completely. And it's, to me, that was one of the phenomenal moment, moments of seeing that he got away with it. It's, it was complicated. I'm not sure exactly what happened. In the, Adan, in the end, Adele wouldn't press charges. But um, it was never a consideration that he would go to jail. And this was sort of, this really struck me because he'd just been writing um, advertisements for myself and essays like The White Negro that sort of glorified violence and, you know, championed the hipster and, and the guy who lived on the edge and was just real dangerous and cool. And it's kind of clear that he identified this, this right? But he does something wrong. There's never a question that he would go to jail. He's way too bourgeois. He's way too bourgeois. He's got, he's surrounded by all these loving family members and friends who made sure that he would never and he, and he went to Bellevue for two weeks. Um, and it, it was clear he never got psychiatric treatment beyond that either. So he really he got away with it. So to make a long answer shorter, um, it, was, it was about a guy who killed his wife and got away with it. Mailer stabbed his wife and got away with it. It also had the, the, uh, the heroine was modeled on his current.
current wife, Beverly, and there's a guy in there, Shago Martin, who's, who's modeled on Miles Davis, who had been one of Beverly's lovers before she met Norman. So there's a lot of truth in that, yeah. She didn't No. First she said she fell on some glass. When it became clear surgically that that wasn't true, she said, I don't know what happened to me. She was very in states of denial, and then about a month afterwards, she refused to press charges, saying, I have no complaint against Norman Mailer. And amazingly, they tried to get to, uh, get back together again after the stabbing and make a go of the marriage. I don't want this to be a discussion of stabbings, but how did he live down the, um, the, the murder that he got out of jail? Because he was, he was a great writer. I mean, he, uh, Mailer felt that what was it, George Jack Henry, Henry ha Abbott? Abbott Do you remember was this? a great writer, and he got him out of jail, and he murdered somebody else with a knife. <laughs> right. He wrote, um, right, in the belly of the belly. beast, it was some prison writing that Mailer and others thought was really spectacular. And it was published um, this one summer, and Mailer was instrumental in getting Al um, Abbott out of jail. And the publication came at the same time when Abbott was out of jail. And Abbott just could not handle living in the real world. He was like a career convict. And um, he, he'd go into a store, and if the, if the, um, the, um, so any kind of interchange, he thought that maybe the other person was dissing him. Uh, he didn't understand where to buy toothpaste. All these, like, he couldn't, he just couldn't fit in at all. And he got in an argument with a waiter at this Lower East Side restaurant over where the men's room was or something and he thought the guy was dissing him and he stabbed him. Norman um, first said, he, all the attention focused on Norman, how could he have done this? And Norman's first said that culture is worth a little risk. In other words, he'd do it again. It was worth it to get this brilliant writer out of jail. And then he, his, um, his wits surfaced and, uh, and he did I think he felt it very felt very strongly that he had he should have, he'd done something wrong. A lot of a lot of wrong, wrong things happened. I mean, the people who published Abbott, the parole board, a, a lot of people should have seen this coming, but nobody did. Yeah, I mean that's that's an example of when some of Mailer's stunts have real consequence, and consequences he doesn't foresee, and consequences that he would be very sorry for afterward. It's a bad business. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand your point about him not being able to be a leftist because he couldn't be a collective. You have people like George Bernard Shaw and Pablo Picasso, Sart, Siqueiros, Diego Rivera. You could go on a list like 100 miles long. And what, what I'm hearing from you is, what, or I think I'm hearing is that you, you kind of make excuses for this, you know, fellow that he stabbed his wife, he was drunk, and it was a wild party, and they had a letter from Castro on his desk, you know. But, I mean, uh, this is attempted murder, or it's trying to stab somebody. There's no excuses for that kind of behavior. And also, I was, if you want to know something personal, I was uh, sitting in the Fijam, and Harry Belafonte was playing about 40 years ago or something. I had a high school date, and a guy was insulting, saying nasty things to Harry Belafonte about uh, racist things. And Norman Mailer told the guy to shut up. And the guy said to him, you want to go outside and tell me to shut up? When the guy started walking toward him and he got very scared. I saw that with my eyes. He was no, he was a bully is what he was with fighting. He likes to talk about the, the ring, the King story with the, he made a movie about a boxing match, cutting off the ring and all this kind of macho talk. But basically I see him as a person who wrote, it's my opinion I'm giving you, I mean, everybody has an opinion, you know, they say uh, opinions are like all kinds of holes, everybody has one. But uh, what I want to say is I see him have write, written a book called The Naked and the Dead, which was a great book. After that, he never wrote anything, and he's a bum. That's what um, he did. It's, a, it's, a, it's a valid point of view, actually, and I, I'm not giving it a lot of play here because I'm trying to convince people to read Mailer again and to read my book. But it's, it's something that I had to go through. I, I went through probably, when I began, sort of a period of hero worship because I liked his writings in the 50s and 60s so much. And because of this kind of imagine and, and, imagination and energy that I've been talking about, but there's no question. I think in bravery is maybe that's the thing that Mailer holds to be the highest good. Bravery, not 
goodness or anything, bravery. That's the that's the good. And and I think that like Hemingway, and I think that Mailer's been cowardly. Um, I think later, especially later in his life, in the 70s and especially the 80s, and his politics began to shift to the right. Um, the point you made about the him. I think it's possible for artists to be leftists without subjecting themselves to the collective. But anyway, I, I compare him to Sartre, who was at the same time that, that he was had a writing career, he was doing a lot of valuable political work in France, and Norman just wasn't here. But just one example, Norman and the CIA. In 1975, uh, it is... Um, at a birthday party of the Four Seasons, Mailer announced that he was going to create this thing called the Fifth Estate, which was going to police the FBI and the CIA. And he didn't approve of those organizations, and he thought there should be some organization that watched, it, watched them. And I thought this was kind of a, well, it's a wacky idea, but it, and, and there's a lot of things wrong in the execution of it. But um, I thought Mailer was getting at something. But it's, it's a long story, but he basically backed down from this. <laughs> it was over tax reasons. They put a lien on his house because he was claiming his house as some kind of tax deduction because of this fifth estate. But he basically got scared, is long and short of it. And um, it's, it's a long story. And, but he came, he went from that to championing it championing the CIA. Um, Harlot's Ghost is a novel that just glorifies the CIA. And I, I see Norman sort of being scared and becoming more status quo in the 80s and 90s. And uh, it was always there, I think. There was always something of the bully about him. Um, it was constitutional in a way. And I think he, he hated that in himself. He knew at some level that he was, he could be cowardly. I could go on and on. The Norman story. Everybody's got a Norman story. I find. He had four wives, did he not? Or six. Six. How many children? Well, he he's, has eight, and he adopted uh, his last wife's son from an earlier marriage. So he's enough for a baseball team. <laughs> he's he takes real pride in being a being a patriarch. Yeah, you know, he had me to his house once for drinks. I'm not his authorized biographer, though he has one, this guy Bob Lucid, who's been writing it for 30 years, and it's supposed to be three volumes, which I think is kind of ridiculous. Norman's not Winston Churchill. and um, But Norman is very loyal to this guy, and Norman told me that he wouldn't help me, nor would he stand in my way. He'd just watch, you know, while I did this. So I thought it was really gentlemanly that not this summer, but the summer before, I was staying in Wellfleet, and he was in Provincetown, and he knew I was there, and through a mutual friend, had me over for drinks. And every, the surface of every, every single service in that house was covered with family photographs. I mean, that's his thing now. He loves being the patriarch. Yeah. Any problems writing about a living author other than simply getting his cooperation that, that cropped up in the course of doing this? Or yeah, special um, issues? It's, a, um, um, it's a completely different process writing about somebody who's dead and his papers are in archive. One other condition of my not being authorized is I never saw mailers, letters, and papers. Those are in the hands of the authorized biographer. What I had to do instead was interview people, interview people like Matt, you know, over a hundred people. And I don't like writing about a living person. I feel like I'm invading their privacy somehow, even if they're public figures like Norman. And it's difficult interviewing like that. But I think it's the wave of the future in biography because there's no more written records anymore unless you print out your email religiously. Um, your communications with other people aren't recorded. Nobody writes letters anymore. There aren't really going to be archives of um, of people after they're dead. And so what you have to do while they're alive is sort of go around and download people's memories of the person, I think. And then I think ideally sit back and wait for the subject to die and the dust to settle and then um, uh, write your biography. But I think it's the wave of the future. Yeah. Did he finally realize that he was not a movie maker after oh, his failures? <laughs> Although Tough Guys Don't Dance was photographed beautifully. It is, it's, and it's, it's a lot of, on a lot of critics' ten worst lists, especially with Ryan O'Neill going, oh, God, oh, man, oh, God, oh, man. But, 
Yeah, it was a great moment. I mean, he he directed three other movies, two black and whites, and a, and a, one called Maidstone in the '60s, and um, they're really wonderful to see. But they were complete disasters. There was a, they had a retrospective at the um, um, the f film forum downtown, and um, there were the anthology film archives and there weren't very many people in the audience but the people who were there were rolling in the aisles which i know was not as intent and um and then he made the infamous tough guys don't dance with a lot of studio money in the um 80s proving definitively that he could not make movies so i think it's i think it's got its moments too it's so male or that movie i mean it's you can recognize a male or product that it's he's stamped on it in that case it's it's a disaster. He, he hasn't given up, though. He still threatens to make movies all the time. His son is a movie producer. Uh, he produced Two Guys and a Girl, which is kind of a Malarian subject. It's, um, James Talbot, I think, is the director? Toback. Toback. Yeah. Many people find him quite misanthropic and therefore kind of... A, a male area <laughs> choice, yeah. Well, well yeah. He's, he doesn't have a gift for dialogue, but the subject matter is kind of interesting. Yeah. Yeah, he's drawn to, he's drawn to interesting things. And I, I really, you know, I take your point. Um, it was very difficult writing about him, um, especially moments when I thought he was really um, bad, when he was really bad to his wives beyond stabbing them. I mean, he could be really horrible to them and mean to women in general, mean to other writers. It was very hard to write about. On the other hand, there's, you know, you, you live with somebody this long, you both love them and hate them, and then they become sort of, I mean, I find Norman um, kind of amusing um, most of the time. Somebody at one of these talks that I've been giving had a really great story about Norman and Che Guevara, which it sums up Norman. Um, now, Che Guevara is an important revolutionary. It could have been really great for them to make contact, right? It was around 59 or 60, and Che was here because Castro was at the UN. And um, so it was a unique opportunity. And there was a fundraiser for Che on the Upper East Side. And Norman came in midway through and he stomped in and he was really, really drunk. And he went up to Guevara, Che, and grabbed his right hand and said, Hombre! And, and the two, it's kind of Che's aides, took him and escorted him out of the room. I mean, it's a missed opportunity. He made a jerk out of himself. I think it's kind of funny. The, the saddest thing, really, or one of the many sad things about him is um, in the mayoral campaign when he had all these young people act, act activated to work for him and really enthusiastic about his campaign and he gave a party for them at the village gate at the downtown nightclub and he showed up really really drunk and he called all his supporters pigs and worse and uh, it's a kind of a famous speech. It's been recorded, so you can read it in various places. And uh, there's a picture of it in here. He's just, he's got a drink in hand, and, and uh, it looks so drunk. And these poor volunteers, I talked to a couple of them, they said they were, they were absolutely distraught after that. Now, how could he call them pigs when they've been volunteering for him? And once again, he blew it. He seems to have a need to shoot himself in the foot. I think finally it's traceable back to... Um, the one thing he looked like he was going to be with his family background, his mother, just a Jewish mother. You've never seen one like Fanny Mailer. Um, uh, he was he was really on a career as a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn, and that was the one thing he didn't want to be. So whenever possible, when it looked like he was doing something good, that something he was working on was being put into action and realized, he shot himself in the foot. Um, sometimes they didn't, and those were his victories, and those were his successes. And I still want to say, too, that given all this, I still admire his work. Some of it, especially the later work, I find, again, cowardly, I guess I'd call it. But, you know, he needed to make money. He, well, he got lazy. He has no one around him who checks him, who says, Norman, that's not a good idea, who, when he's making money to see how much fits in a briefcase, says, Norman, there are better uses for your time. You know, people just say, oh, Norman, what a great idea. In fact, when I had drinks with him, our mutual friend was there and his wife was there. And if Norman said something remotely funny, it was, oh, guffaws, guffaws. And if Norman said something remotely um, insightful, it's, Norman, you're so wise. Norman, what wisdom. You know, so he's surrounded by these 
people and he can really he feels he can do no wrong and it was a great gift to him growing up like that his mother you know he felt he could do absolutely anything um, unfortunately there was this flip side where he had to not be a good boy and uh, that all adds up to this very checkered career that I think the man's had yeah uh, didn't uh, Sartre uh, wasn't he instrumental in getting uh, Janae out of jail I don't really know about that. Because that that's the same type of thing. That's a guy who should be left in jail, um, even though he's a great writer. You know, it's one of the hazards <laughs> of being a writer, and I've learned this from doing literary biographies, is that people in jail write to writers, and they befriend, and people, writers often befriend people in jail, sometimes with disastrous results. Styron, William Styron, that, the writer William Styron, who had been a friend of Mailer's in the 50s and 60s, it, inevitably they had a falling out. I think Styron called his wife a lesbian. Something, you know, unforgivable. So, but Styron, they made up over the Abbott thing because um, Styron said, I have a Jack Henry Abbott in my life. He had helped a guy get free, a convicted, I don't know what, get freed, and the guy immediately got out and raped and killed a woman. And it, it, it's a hazard almost of the profession. Henry Miller had a lot of convicts who he corresponded with too. And of course to Mailer, you know, it's especially irresistible. You know, convicts, man, you know, he does glorify violence. He does glorify rule breaking, uh, even law breaking. And it gets him into all kinds of trouble. I, I thought it was worth pointing out, I mean, as I understood it, uh, Mailer got a little bit of a bum rap over the Abbott thing, though. He, the guy was going to get out of jail, most likely, and Mailer gave him a job and a place to stay and attempted to help him out to get back into society, and uh, it didn't work out. But he shouldn't have... He was, he was taken to task in the press, and one of the, the real problems... The, one of the real problems is that he just didn't handle it very well. I think that's he, right. He overreacted and... and uh, 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 got enraged at the reporters, which is not the thing you do. And well, right, we don't hear about William Styron's, you know, convict. I mean, Norman just had to do that thing about culture's worth a little risk, and it was disastrous. I think that's right. I think he, you know, you can't. Somebody kills somebody. You, if you handed the guy the gun, I mean, where does responsibility begin and end? And it's true, he was getting out anyway. Um, and you know, Norman typically said, um, gee, I would have never have done that, have a guy publish his first book and be out of jail on the same day, because I know what a, you know, heavy thing that is. <laughs> but, but um, missing the point entirely again, but um, I, he did in a way get a bum rap. I think that's true. I think you said you were interested in, in Hemingway, and uh, he corresponded with uh, people that were in the uh, Abraham Lincoln brigades a lot, the, the uh, Spanish Civil War. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I... Milt Wolf was a commander, and he's got a lot of letters that uh, the Milt Wolf estate, as a matter of fact, has these letters that correspond with him. Because you're going to write a book about that, you said. Well, I might, yeah. yeah. I mean, I just thought I'd mention that. Oh, that's interesting. I'll follow that up. But I'm not sure. I think I'm almost positive I've discovered that Hemingway corresponded with convicts, with people in jail. It's just that it goes with the territory. But these were people fighting in Spain. I mean, uh, in yeah. the Spanish Civil War. Well, that's... 1936. That's... Yeah, that's a little different, but, um, yeah. but I don't know, we'll see what I find with Hemingway. Yeah, that was Spanish. Yeah. Well, e even even later, like uh, when uh, the original publishers of uh, Brett Easton Ellis' book uh, backed out because they realized how, you know, violent the book was, Mailer was like, you know, calling them, you know, to task for backing out, and he was championing the book. And uh, I read a few pages of it, and uh, that was enough for me. And I was wondering, if I got to meet Brett Easton Ellis, I would ask him, well, what's the point? Yeah, <laughs> so would I. Um, so would I. And uh, I think, I'm fairly sure that, Nor uh, that Norman uh, took it, that on as a free speech issue, you know, yeah. and, and a lot, you get a lot of leeway if that's your <laughs> argument. Anyone else, or do you, we could, you could break up and you can ask me questions up here. Anyway, thanks for coming out. Okay. Oh, yeah, and I, and I have books to sell, and I can, they'll be signed.
Mary Dearborn holds a doctorate in English and Comparative Literature from Columbia University, where she was a Mellon Fellow in Humanities. Her previous books include The Happiest Man Alive, a biography of Henry Miller, and Queen of Bohemia, The Life of Louise Bryant. Biography on Book TV can... ...nomination, this would be. And this would, and to his satisfaction, found how do you fit $25,000 in a briefcase. Why? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, if you were going to use it in a novel, it's one thing. But this and the Lego, um, the Lego, uh, uh, model were not, they didn't hurt anyone. They were, um, um, they were just typical of his energy and imagination. And the idea of actually putting something into being, actually doing something. I found this, when, one of the things that I admire Norman most for is his, um, is his um, race for mayor in um, New York City in 1969, and some of you probably remember that. Um, it was a it was a distinctive campaign. He took it really seriously. the The central platform was um, uh, that New York should secede from the Union and become the 51st state, and uh, that fiscally this wasn't really very sound. Though he worked it out exactly in his position papers. He was in deadly earnest. But some of the, the visions that he had were really, were really um, prescient. And a lot of the ideas that he had in the mayoral campaign that were part of his platform have actually been floated with, you know, some seriousness. And he wanted to close Manhattan to cars. I mean, that's something that's been floated for a long time. Some of them were pretty fanciful, but they weren't likely to hurt anyone, really. He wanted to build um, Vegas East at Coney Island. Not bad. Um, he wanted to hold a yearly Grand Prix in Central Park. Well, that might hurt somebody, but, uh, but you know, if it's, you know. Um, on the other hand, he wanted to have, here, a Central City Farmer's Market with ethnic foods for sale. That's pretty good, 1969, it happened. Um, he wanted every neighborhood to have a zoo. And one of the central platforms was neighborhood control. Um, which was really uh, forward-looking. He wanted people in a certain neighborhood to decide how often they wanted their garbage to be picked up, who their garbage men should be, all from garbage on up and on down to every issue, sh issue should be up to the neighborhoods. Uh, I don't know how this would be implemented, but he, he had a vision. Um, he wanted to return national baseball teams to Brooklyn and Manhattan areas and that it was necessary to rebuild the entire urban United States. In response to this, Mailer decried blandly institu institutional modern architecture, especially flat top si si skyscrapers without ornaments on them. He thought that to spare the countryside, maintain small towns, and keep the old urban neighborhoods, especially those with character, cities must be built upward. Um, there's a picture in my book of the scale of this. Lego City, and you can see it's taller than he is. And if you look at it close up, it's really quite neat. Um, he wrote in architectural form, we must be able to live in houses 100 stories tall, 200 stories high, far above the height of buildings as we know them. New cities with great towers must r rise on the plain, cities higher than mountains, cities with room for 400 million to live. His new obsession wasn't really so odd. Norman had trained at Harvard as an engineer. Um, a lot of, when I was doing the research for this book, a lot of, I talked to a lot of Norman's Harvard classmates, and most of them didn't, said he could not possibly have majored in engineering. There was no engineering major. But he did, in fact. It was really to please his parents. He'd been good as a child at building model airplanes. They thought maybe he had a talent in that direction. Uh, but anyway, he majored as an engineer, and he loved building, enjoyed making things, and was reasonably good at it, always inventive. He decided to build a model of a city that could be populated by four million people and to build it in his own living room. He conceived it as a monument to his sweeping utopian vision. Uh, at the quotidian level, Norman acted as the brains behind the project, soon discovering that he didn't like the sound of the plastic Lego pieces snapping together. It struck him, he said, as vaguely obscene. He delegated the task to his wife's stepbrother and to a uh, Provincetown handyman. And the two men drove Norman's 1961 blue convertible Falcon out to the Lego plant in New Jersey. He can't just go to Toys R Us. He goes to the Lego plant and returned with cases of the co colored blocks. Then Norman them, directed them to build, instructing them to create hanging bridges, buildings with trap doors, and four-foot-high towers, all constructed on a um, piece of plywood public service by your local cable television operator. Next, 
Biography on Book TV with Mary Dearborn discussing this work, Mailer, a Biography. The book chronicles the life of author Norman Mailer. It reviews his professional career, such as winning the Pulitzer Prize twice, to his colorful personal history. Her remarks took place recently at a Barnes & Noble booksellers in New York City. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'd like to welcome you all to Barnes & Noble. Uh, it's a real pleasure for us tonight to welcome Mary Dearborn. She joins us to, dis to discuss her new book, Mailer, a biography. Uh, Mailer is the first full account of the legendary writer. With unprecedented access to Mailer's friends, relations, and antagonists, and making extensive use of photographs and correspondence never before published, uh, Mary's biography fills in the familiar outlines of Mailer's personal life from his brilliant successes uh, as well as his notorious failures. Uh, Mary holds a doctorate in English and comparative literature from Columbia. She is also the author of the highly acclaimed books The Happiest Man Alive, a biography of Henry Miller, and Queen of Bohemia, The Life of Louise Bryant. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mary Dearborn. Hi, and th thanks for coming, and especially thanks for coming out on a night like this. Um, I actually didn't want to call the book Mailer. I wanted to call it Cock of the Walk, and not just because it was for the double entendre, but because Norman often reminds me of a, a bantam cock in a barnyard. Um, <laughs> He, um, what made me think of it first was that he spends his summers and actually all of his time now in Provincetown on the tip of Cape Cod. And um, uh, it's a small community. He doesn't choose to go to the Hamptons, he goes to Provincetown, and it's mostly gay. And uh, it's a house mostly of clabbered, um, I mean, a neighborhood of clabbered houses with um, stairs going up the sides and sort of down at heels. But really nice, and Norm. But Norman, Norman has a brick mansion in the west end of town, and it always struck me that he wanted to be in Provincetown because it could be a big fish in a little pond, something, be a cock of the walk. Um, anyway, I I think the onus is on me to tell you why I wanted to write about Norman Mailer. Um, <clears throat> I could tell you notorious stories till the cows come home, but I thought I'd do this by just reading a few bits. Um, this is about a project that Norman um, put on in the mid-60s, which is when he was doing really his best writing. He was just getting involved with the Vietnam movement. He'd done all the wonderful path-breaking journalism on Kennedy and the New Frontier. And um, he was very busy. But in the background, literally, it is Brooklyn Brownstone. And also keep in mind how small Brownstone living rooms are. They aren't really that big. Me uh, in the background was a project Mailer began in the fall of 1965, ongoing for the rest of the year, and still in residence in the living room of his Brooklyn Heights brownstone, a model for an imaginary city made entirely out of Lego blocks. In many ways, this was a typically Mailerian project. He announced it in advance in the pages of the New York Times Magazine. The pro city, he, he outlined, he said, would change the face not only of public architecture, but of society itself. He had long blamed architecture for many of the woes of contemporary society, and now he applied himself to setting forth his plans and pronouncements, and beginning in the fall of 65, the creation of an actual model, um, actual model city, immense in scale and meticulously planned. Uh, the building of an elaborate model of, made out of children's box may seem frivolous, but Mailer was very earnest about addressing social ills through architecture. In reviewing Lyndon Johnson's campaign book, my Hope for America, he was struck by Johnson's claim that in 50 years there would be 400 million Americans, four-fifths of them in urban, sure this in a brownstone living room, four by eight on five feet legs, five feet tall legs. Constru construction proceeded apace, and Norman re never really did call a halt to it. But someone from the Museum of Modern Art came out to Brooklyn to take photographs of the model, hoping to display it at the, at the museum. At that point, Mailer and his helpers found that the city could not be taken out of the apartment. They consulted movers with cranes and took measurements of, glass, of the glass in the front windows, but they soon saw it couldn't be removed without being disassembled first. 
Here, Norman drew the line. He told the handyman to build a fence around it and leave it where it was. And there it still sits, occupying a third of the living room's floor space. Um, wife number four, Beverly, who contributed a scale model of the United Nations, about that big, to indicate the overall scale of city, professes that she loved it but concedes, quote unquote, it was a bitch to dust. Um, I think there's a, a number of features of building the Lego city that really strike me as very typically Norman Mailer. First of all, it's something that um, many of us might visualize, but few of us would do. Um, it's, it's, Mailer puts ideas into reality. That's one of his specialties. The idea of delegating work to his lackeys is very Mailerian. He conceives an, of an idea, and he tells his buddies, you carry it out. Um, they're going to the top to the Lego plant rather than the local toy store. That's very Norman. Um, and the idea of a sort of game quality, especially a boy's game, is very typical of him. He brought this sort of childish glee to some of these projects. Um, there's a story that I told that didn't get it, that I've heard that didn't get its way into the book about Norman reading about um, a guy, in, some criminal, or bringing $25,000 to somebody in a briefcase. And one of his, a couple of his flunkies were there with him when he, when he read this. And he wondered, how many bills would you have to have and in what denomination? And you or I might wonder this in passing, especially if we're very imaginative and curious, we might think, how many? But what Mailer did, and he had his flunkies did, was sit down with a bunch of paper and glue, and glue paper together, make the thickness of bills, and then figure out mathematically what the 